the fact of the matter is, and this is the problem with, with the way the incentives have been set up, is it, it's like crack cocaine. You become addicted to it, okay, and, and now you need it. And before you're going to take and do, to take the next step, you need another hit. Right? Okay, that's, that is exactly what has happened. And, and instead, what we need is we need to have an incentive system that drives towards improving the overall economics of renewables. And believe me, I, I, I agree that, uh, that conservation, the, the megawatts you don't use, is the cheapest one you're ever going to buy. Right? right? Yeah. So, um, so, you know, it, it makes obvious sense. But, but you know, we, we, we've got a, a messed up we <laughs> value, trade, value trade system. We've got to retrain them to well, they're no, we we, got to take and make the sale on a different basis. The way, you know, we talked about uh, incentives earlier. What, you know, what, what's the ideal? For me, okay, the ideal is to get away from the PTC. Okay, to have government in, invest in, in some of the basic R&D that sets technologies up to be, that, that identifies the technologies that could be successful. To turn it over to the commercial sector at that point, which was much better at commercializing the technologies to allow them to pick the winners and losers. And then at the end of the day, have a set of technologies that compete effectively so that you don't need government subsidies. Okay, now granted, you're always going to have forms of, of tax incentives, accelerated depreciation, things like that, to, in order to, to encourage moving investment up in time. But if you've got a technology that makes sense, that can economically compete, as wind does, for example, in the Oklahoma panhandle, okay, where it is windy, or in, in the Buffalo Ridge in Minnesota and Dakotas, why do you need an additional incentive to line an investor's pocket. You know, is it isn't a 13% return enough? Why do you need a 23% return that doesn't have you know on an investment that doesn't have you know any substantial more risk? I mean, it's it's yeah, but the follow-up to that, it, it's it's going in the wrong direction. So Southern California Edison now just announced a program where if, if the if the customer signs up for it they will ultimately pay for the normal everyday yearly maintenance that should be going on on the HVAC systems, cleaning coils, replacing filters, that normal everyday maintenance, because they know that the economy has forced these business owners to cut back everywhere, and so they cut back on things that actually uh, are, are of value every day. You, and you need to be real careful here, yeah. taking, because I just can't resist taking a good crack analogy and running with it. Um, <laughs> The only thing worse is, is if you're the guy buying the crack and the guy next to you gets to use it. And that's the heart of your problem. When you talk about ROIs, we're talking about ROIs and numbers all day long, but to, as to whom? When you're talking in a commercial environment, the benefit in most, most commercial environments are triple net leases, right? Yeah. Which means if I'm the landlord, for those of you who don't understand real estate, triple net lease means you pay me a base rent, and then you pay your own utility bills and other, other expenses. That's a very simplified discussion. Who invests the capital in the energy improvements? It's not the tenant. It's the landlord. Just, I invest the money. We just got our first landlord to sign up because they finally see that there's a value there in selling their properties. At a, at a there, there you go. But when you talk about retrofit for existent tenants, here's the problem. I invest the capital. The energy savings goes 100% to my tenants. And I've got a five-year lease with three five-year options. I don't get any return on the investment. And landlords, you know, years ago, I've, I've, been, I've been in development for years, so I can say, you know, we're, we're a dull lot. Um, the answer is you go to the tenant and you say, if I could reduce your rent by a dollar, do you want me to do that? Every tenant will say, yes. But landlords either don't try at all because they say, I get nothing out of the deal, or they go to the landlord, the tenant, and say, hey, um, I'm going to do something that will save you $2, but I'm going to take a dollar from you. And as soon as people think something's being taken from them, even if it would have saved them a dollar, they act differently. So you either have to go over to some type of gross lease, modified gross lease, some way that gives the landlord a return on their investment to begin with. Because otherwise, I invest the money in the building. Now, long term, you're absolutely correct. 
Long term, any investment that reduces the total occupancy cost of my tenant means the tenant will likely stay with me longer. Uh, because the cheapest tenant you can get is the one you already have. You don't have to release the space. So if you can reduce their occupancy costs, it makes them better. But where a lot of the debate has missed it, just to wrap it up, is ROI. We can talk ROIs, ROIs all day long, but to whom? If it's, I spend the money and Abbas gets the, the benefit, eh, I'm not so inclined. I'm a nice guy, but I'm not that nice. <laughs> Had, um, so maybe take it away from the boring landlord stuff. Um, so you, in my opinion, you guys are the meat and potatoes, right? And, and you're the meat and the potatoes because, um, not just because of what Craig says, it's the cheapest mag white you're going to use, but because you're really getting at the core issue, which is can we change people's behavior? Can we get them away from the George Lucas shiny, you know, android over there to really changing what they're doing right now? And I, I think that you can talk about ROI all day long and who's going to pay for it, but until you actually get people to address it differently and to incorporate it into their own uh, way of being differently, uh, you're going to have an uphill battle. And it's unfortunate because, I mean, even at a utility, we see efficiency uh, as being a real um, positive effort, whether it's a smart meter program or actually just energy efficiency. Uh, element. So I just want to throw out, just share with you guys, um, some of you might know there's a new Facebook app out there that lets um, people within communities compare energy usage and uses peer pressure and social um, networking to, to show everybody how you're doing within your community. Uh, and it's actually proving to be very popular and quite effective. There's also a really wonderful startup out of New York City called Honest Buildings. And the premise there is that landlords um, and tenants will sign their buildings up to have a green rating and thereby drive market forces as people become more aware and care more. Now, obviously, you've got to get people to care more to become more aware, right? And it's back and, it's back and forth. Um, but, I, but I do think there's, there's something to it that you can throw numbers around all day, but if someone isn't behind it and doesn't understand that, that social shift, that it's not going to go anywhere. That's true. Yeah. As, as the final piece on, on our program, is, is even with the, the ROI discussion, you know, it's under two years or, or something that's palatable to the business owner, the, the way we've really been able to sell it is it's the idea that we're splitting the existing cash flow. You know, we're already paying the utility $1,000 a month, whatever it is, that the, the backing by GE Capital allows that bill to be split to debt service and to new great utility. So it really can be a cash flow neutral cycle for all business owners people just in this economic environment don't want to do anything. It's that complete fear of, of commitment. And you talked about the, the upcoming election. I don't even believe that after the upcoming election it's going to cure any, any fear. So with that said, there's there's all kinds of opportunity out there, but you're still looking at how you convince that. How, how do you think you break that cycle in your industry? How do you get over that hump? What do you think? It's peer pressure, really. It's, it's like, getting it's, like exactly what she said. Yeah. And so you've got a situation where their neighbor did it, so now they'll do it. Yeah. Well, the first kid on the block to do it's it gotta do, yeah. is the toughest thing. So, so, so let me go to a real-life example, back to uh, Colin's boring landlord scenario. Um, just the other day, um, we, 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 uh, we occupy, I don't know, probably 10 floors uh, in an office building in, in downtown L.A. It's probably a 50-story building. Just the other day, we were approached about our firm being the sponsor of putting solar panels on the top of the, uh, the roof of this building. And of course, the emails came to me saying, what do you think of this? And my initial reaction was, okay, who's paying for this? How do I benefit? And this would this be a fantastic thing to do, but, but somehow it's gotta work out economically for uh, the landlord and for the tenant. So I agree there has to be peer pressure, but I think ultimately the economics are gonna drive these decisions. Now, if we ultimately decide to do this, we'd be the first, I think we'd be the first tenant in all of LA who would uh, actually put a solar panels on the top of a high rise office building. And I think that would engender other companies doing the same sort of thing. So then the peer pressure thing would kick in, but I think pure economics are gonna drive the decision initially. 